Now we will take a moment to introduce you to our speaker. Our speaker today will be Dan Merritt. Dan is a senior manager on Raymond's public sector assurance and financial reporting team. He is a member of several professional associations, including the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the Michigan Association of Certified Public Account Accountants, the West Michigan Chapter of the Association of Government Accountants, the Michigan Government Financer Finance Officers Association, and the National Government Finance Officers Association. Dan is a CPA and a certified government financial manager with over 10 years of experience in the governmental arena as an auditor, consultant, and contracted finance director. Dan, you may begin the presentation. Thanks very much, Ashley. Well, good morning to everyone. I see we have uh, a lot of participants here today just from taking a brief look at the list. I think some of you already know me, uh, maybe are one of working with one of my clients or are one of my clients. Um, so welcome to all of you. Um, I'm sure you're used to seeing Stephen Bland up here for this presentation. Um, and he's he sort of passed the torch a bit to me and I'm I'm looking forward to to doing a lot of this training and a lot more trainings in the near future. Coming to you live here today from snowy Ann Arbor, Michigan. I hope that some of you have stayed home uh, and are, are experiencing this from your couch or your living room as it's not a particularly pleasant day to travel. Um, as Ashley stated, I'm Dan Merritt. I've been working in the field about 10 years. I've spent some time on both sides of the desk, both as auditor and auditee. Right now, uh, my primary role is as an auditor. Um, so for our session today, we're going to be talking about new GASB standards. Primarily, we're going to be talking about GASB 87, which is the new standard on leasing. Uh, and we'll also spend a fair amount of time with GASB 96, with it, which is the uh, new standard on its subscription-based information technology agreements. Uh, GASB 87, for some of you, is already effective. For many of my clients, for many of those on this presentation, we've already gone through the first year of implementation for GASB 87. So for some of you, this will be, you know, sort of a refresher on something that you've already been through. For others of you, for instance, those who are December 31st and didn't choose to early implement last year, this might be new, this might be something you're working through right now. Um, and the new upcoming standard will be, be that will be effective first for June 30th year ends is GASB 96. We'll spend most of our time on those two standards, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time on GASB 94, uh, public-private partnerships, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on GASB 101, which is the standard on compensated absences. Then finally, we'll talk a little bit about some of the exposure drafts and concept statements that the GASB is coming out with in, in the near future. So I'm going to pause here real briefly. We've already got our CPE prompt number one. So I'll give us about, uh, let's say, 20 seconds to, to respond to that here. And I won't be offended if you say I'm just here for the CPE credit. It's it's happened to me before too. So we're all we're all out out here looking to stay qualified. So all right, let's move on. So just wanted to list out real briefly some of the standards that are upcoming. We're going to spend most of our time talking about GASB 87. Of course, there are a few other standards such as the conduit debt obligation standard, the replacement of of LIBOR with SOFR. Unless you have a hedging uh, derivative, you probably aren't too concerned about 93. And of course, 97 is about uh, uh, component year, unit criteria related to 457 plans. Uh, really don't think there's going to be a lot of impact to most of our clients for, for the standards other than 87 on this slide, but we do put them up there just in case uh, someone, it, it sparks some thought and, and you want to talk to your professional advisor. Um, um, you always want to be thinking about what standards are coming up. And then, of course, we'll have GASB 94 on public-private, public-public, and APA arrangements, the SPITA standard that everyone wants to know about, and, and 101 for compensated absences. You might also say, Dan, you're, you're missing a few numbers here. You've got GASB 95, 98, 99, 100, which are related to sort of smaller technical corrections for the most part, and some things that are more auditor-specific regarding restatements and error corrections. So we aren't going to cover any of those in detail today. 
So let's dive right in with GASB 87 on leases. So the GASB felt that they needed to, to put something new into place to address lease agreements. Uh, it sort of follows the FASB standard, right? When the FASB issues a standard, the Governmental uh, Accounting Standards Board is pretty sure that they're probably going to address something similar if they think that there's somewhat wide applicability. So the new standard defines leases as financings of the right to use an underlying asset. It establishes a single model for all leases, i.e. you don't have any more operating versus capital leases. All of us remember if you were taking your CPA exam or if you were doing accounting under the old standards, uh, uh, the capital leases sort of had four major criteria. You had an ownership transfer, a bargain purchase option, if your lease term was 75% or more of the expected economic life, present value of lease payments, 90. You know, you knew the sort of checklist of how you determined operating versus capital. Well, unfortunately, we're about to turn all of that on its head and just strictly replace that standard. Um, so it's no longer have an operating versus capital. Now you just have short term and long term leases. It's going to tell us that we got to put those things on the balance sheet. You're going to have leased assets, leased assets and leased liabilities now to record on both the lessee and the lessor side. Um, and we'll talk more about that in detail. And of course, it's effective for uh, fiscal years ending after 6-15-2022. A couple of slides in, in here. I'll try to clarify when we're talking about year end date effective and year beginning date effective. We, we tend to, in our slides, put in the year end date effective dates. Um, but the GASB always discloses the the be, for fiscal years beginning on or after. So I'll, I'll try to clarify as we we see those dates. So lease definition: a lease is a contract that conveys the control of the right to use of another entity's non-financial asset uh, as specified in the contract for a period of time in an exchange or an exchange-like transaction. So what is the GASB trying to communicate here? They're trying to say just because a contract doesn't say lease in the actual agreement doesn't mean that there's not a potential lease that maybe needs to be evaluated. I was talking to a client just the other day and he said to me, Dan, I don't think I have any leases. And we started to go through some of his revenue and expenditure accounts and went, oh, actually, I've got an agreement, you know, to 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 uh, that I, I get to use this asset from another organization, but it's not a lease. It's not explicitly a lease. Well, if we meet the lease definition, you probably have a lease. So you really got to be thinking about economic substance of contracts and not just um, sort of uh, uh, what which contracts say lease or don't say lease. So control of the right to use, what does the GASB mean by that? They mean that you have the right to obtain the present service capacity of the asset, and you have the right to determine the nature and the manner of the use of the underlying asset. Basically, do, do you have the right to use it? Can you determine how it's used within the bounds of that contract? You might well have a lease. They specifically scoped out anything that's a financial asset. The GASB, in their wisdom, has decided that we already have enough guidance about how to account for financial assets under GASB 72 and some of the other clarifying standards that have been issued around financial assets. And they specifically wanted this standard to apply to, to assets like land, buildings, vehicles, equipment, that type of thing, things that we would have probably traditionally considered as either operating or capital leases. So as I know, mentioned earlier, it includes contracts not explicitly defined as leases, but that otherwise might meet the definition. And it's also an important caveat that it, it, it could include it could include a contract that has a lease component, right? It doesn't include contracts that are just for services, but of course we know that in the real world, contracts often have multiple components. You might say, you know, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to lease this from you, and also you're going to do certain other things for me in this contract. Maybe there's maintenance, maybe there's a specific service that's going to be provided, and the contract might specify separate prices for those specific components or elements and it might not if there is a if there is a component that meets the definition of GASB 87 we probably have some consideration here where, where we need to be thinking about how do we you know should we account account for this all as one lease under 87 are there components that need to be extracted you know and this is a particularly difficult thing because we're going to have to exercise some professional judgment when we're talking about components um, um, so if you have a contract where you think, 
hmm, I might have multiple components that might have a leased asset there in there as well. Uh, it's a good time to start having those conversations about, you know, are we going to break this out into separate service components? Uh, how are we going to account for this? That type of thing. Talk to your auditor about uh, uh, how you're going to do that accounting, how you're going to separate it. Um, because those embedded lease contracts, as we've, we've taken to calling them, can be very difficult to sort of uh, uh, allocate if the contract doesn't specify particular prices or segments. Other things that are excluded from the scope of this statement, uh, leases of intangible assets, leases of biological assets, leases of inventory, which are less common for governments, uh, service concession arrangements, which actually we're going to talk about later under GASB 94, service concession arrangements are defined under GASB 60, are excluded from the lease standard, conduit debt arrangements, and supply contracts. We're also going to exclude short-term leases. Uh, the GASB uh, uh, specifically thinks that part of the value that they're adding with this standard is that they're removing some of the reporting that we would have had to do under the previous standards, where you had to report on your operating leases in your footnotes and specifically disclose the accounting related to, to material operating leases or material capital leases. And they say, okay, we're providing some clarification. You don't have to do much with short-term leases. Maybe that reduces some of the reporting burden. I'm of the personal opinion that they've managed to net overall increase the reporting burden, not uh, decrease it here, but th th there is some discussion of that and their consideration of that in the standard. Also contracts to transfer ownership. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Short-term leases are leases that have a maximum possible lease term. So we're going to talk in a moment about assessing the lease term. But when you assess that lease term, if your maximum possible lease term is 12 months or less at inception, you're going to recognize it essentially as a current period inflow outflow of res resources. Um, the GASB doesn't feel like there's any additional disclosure needed for short-term leases beyond, you know, reporting your sort of expenditures for their, or your revenues for the current year. And so for short-term leases, which include rolling month-to-month, year-to-year leases, um, where the maximum possible lease term is the non-cancelable portion, that being 12 months or less, there's not really a lot of reporting necessary. So if you can scope something out of GASB 87, um, you're, you're in business in terms of, of, of reducing your reporting burden. GASB standard also uh, specifies uh, specific rules for contracts that transfer ownership. This being, if you transfer ownership of the underlying asset at or uh, at the beginning of the contract, or you have an automatic transfer of ownership at the end of the contract, uh, you want to report this as a financed purchase rather than a lease. I know one question that's come up a couple of times. Uh, okay, I have a one dollar per agreement. At the end of the term, it transfers for one dollar. Generally speaking, I think most uh, others that I've talked to agree. If there's a one dollar transfer clause at the end, uh, that's effectively an automatic transfer. The GASB explicitly ad addresses the difference here between on the bargain purchase uh, line item. Of course, remember that was one of our capital asset. Uh, considerations before, and they they specifically noted that they think because there are so many possible decisions that a government could make around a bargain, bargain purchase agreement, they don't consider that to be an automatic transfer of ownership. So if you have one of these contracts where you say, okay, you're checking all the boxes, you're going like, is this a contract where I'm doing a transfer ownership or is this a lease agreement? And, and it, you want to equate that automatic transfer with a bargain purchase option, th that's not the case. Those are, those are different under the new leasing standard. Uh, examples of this might be leases that, where, that provide uh, legal title uh, to a vehicle, often vehicle leases uh, transfer ownership at the end or have a uh, potentially could have a bargain purchase agreement. Remember, you got to look, be careful about those specific two things. Um, but a, a vehicle where you're, you're paying for it throughout the term of the lease agreement, and then at the end, it automatically transfers to you, um, that could be a contract that transfers ownership. Remember, again, on, as noted on the previous slide, uh, we report that as a finance purchase agreement rather than a lease. So that's going to stay in your debt footnote. It's just some of the language is going to change. It's going to look a lot like reporting a capital lease. Uh, just the language will be different. We won't call it a capital lease. We'll call it a finance purchase agreement. At right, this time, I think we hit CPE prompt number two. So let's pause for a second and uh, put that one up. 
Again, I hope you're joining us today from home and didn't have to venture out into the winter wonderland out there. But um, if you did, uh, safe, safe driving to everyone. All right, so under the old types of leases, operating capital, new types, we could have a short-term lease, you could have a finance purchase. Again, that's going to look a lot like your previously reported uh, capital lease. If you get lucky and you only have finance purchases, you're uh, probably the amount of work that you're going to put into this is less. And then if you have an, a lease under GASB 87, that's where we're, we're going to start to get into the accounting here. So I have a lease under GASB 87, and uh, what do I need to do? Well, I either need to book a lease asset and a lease liability if I'm the lessee, or I'm going to book the lease receivable and the deferred inflow if I'm the lessor. And I'm going to value those, those uh, 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 long-term sort of balance sheet items based on the present value of the payments expected to be made for the lease term. This is sort of the general uh, top line statement here that, that the present value of the payments expected to be made for the lease term. Seems simple, right? Well, but how do we execute that? Well, the first thing we're going to have to do is we have to determine what our lease term is. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the non-cancelable period that we have the right to use that asset. So let's imagine that you have a five-year contract and you say, well, I have the right to use this asset for five years. And then we add any subsequent periods in the future that are covered by a lessee or lessor, sort of, but let's call this a one-sided option to extend, and that we think that we're going to extend. Again, it says reasonably certain to be exercised and any periods that are covered by a one-sided, i.e. lessee or lessor's option to terminate if reasonably certain not to be exercised. So if I have a five-year agreement and there's a two-year clause to extend that I could choose to accept or reject, remember just me uh, as, as the city, the school district, what have you, not the counterparty, and I think I'm going to exercise that op option to extend, then I would add that to my lease term. I'd have a seven-year non-cancellable term. If we both have the option to terminate, both the lessee and the lessor, we're going to consider that a cancelable period and exclude that from the lease term. Again, a rolling month-to-month, -month, a rolling year-to-year -year lease uh, would be considered to be cancelable terms by both parties and would be excluded from the lease term. I've seen a few of these thus far, not super common, but every once in a while, there'll be a funding or a cancellation clause uh, uh, where it says, uh, it, this lease will continue, you know, if funded by the budget, or uh, I've seen one lease where the two parties were to meet as part of the annual budgeting process and determine uh, uh, you know, what the allocation of funding would be. And there's sort of the implied statement in there that that it could be canceled if it wasn't going to be funded. Well, uh, the GASB says you should only uh, uh, affect the lease term if it's reasonably certain it'll be exercised. So if you have a five-year lease and it says every year, you know, the, the government has to reauthorize the budget for this to at least to continue, um, if you're reasonably certain that that budget will continue to be authorized, you would include those periods in your lease term. So how do I go about assessing this? Well, a great way to, to start is, is the GASB says you should begin to assess all of the factors relevant to the lease that the lessee or the lessor will exercise those options, i.e. economic incentives, disincentives. Basically, how do I make that decision? I know we said back here, if we are, are, are reasonably certain to be exercised, right? Well, basically, the GASB is trying to give you a decision tree to help you figure out what, what does it mean if we're reasonably certain to exercise uh, some of these terms of the standard. They include, uh, and I, there's, there's a sort of a five-step process that the GASB includes in the standard, and it talks about significant economic incentives, significant economic disincentives, what I'd recommend is, especially if you're a decentralized operation and you have a lease with a division of your of your government, and you're trying to figure out if you're likely or not to, to continue this lease term, pull up that language right out of the standard, sit down with the manager in your, your department who's overseeing that lease and sort of walk through it and say, hey, what's your gut feeling about, you know, thinking about economic incentives, disincentives, 
uh, the history of exercising that option to extend or terminate. Do you think you're going to keep, uh, do you think you're going to continue to use this asset? Do you think it's likely you're going to terminate? And again, it's, there's going to be some professional judgment that goes into that decision. So when should we reassess the term? Basically, if we change course, right? We, we're not perfect. We can't see the future. Uh, if we, we, we went through our, our decision-making tree and we said, uh, we, we had that five-year term, we thought we were going to pick up that additional two years. Uh, we get to the end of that five-year term and we said, actually, we're going to terminate. We think there's a better deal out there. Um, we decided we're not going to exercise that option. Or maybe your counterparty had the option to extend or the option to terminate, and they made a different decision than you thought they were going to. Um, if, if, if you change, if, if the course actually changes based on what you initially said you thought was going to happen, at that point, you would reassess your lease term. Lease recognition and measurement. So on the lessee side, um, you've got a lease liability and you've got an intangible right to use of the asset. Uh, uh, on the lease liability side in your financial statements, you're going to have a due within one year and a not due within one year portion. If you're in a governmental statement, you're going to have, uh, if you're in an enterprise fund statement, you're going to have a current non-current portion. Uh, uh, and on the other side, you're going to have an intangible right to use of the asset, which is generally reported as part of your capital assets. And, and it's also reported in your capital asset footnote. On the lessor recognition and measurement side, you've got a lease receivable. Again, we're going to have uh, a current non-current portion of that if it's in an enterprise fund. But if it's in a governmental fund, you probably will have in your note disclosure the amount expected not to be collected with the one in one year. Remember, we don't usually break down that receivable current versus non-current in a governmental activities statement. Um, and the deferred inflow of resources that offsets that lease receivable. Uh, usually at the beginning of the term, those things are going to be equal, though we will talk about a few situations in which they might not be. So lease liability. Again, we're measuring this at the present value of payments to be made for the lease term. Well, okay, so we know we're going to have to do a present value calculation. We have decided on what our lease term is. What payments should we include? Well, the GASB also gives us a list of payments, the most common ones being fixed payments and payments that are fixed in substance, meaning payments that you can determine. They say, oh, it's based on the CPI rate or it's based on something that I can measure at the inception of the lease agreement. Uh, uh, those things uh, that we can sort of measure and, and might be fixed in substance would be included in our payments for calculating this lease liability. Also contingent payments, it's something in the contract that says, if you execute this, then a payment, this payment might will be made. And you think you're reasonably certain that that contingency will be exercised, you'd include that in your lease payments. You know, for your standard just building lease, a lot of times this is just going to end up being your regular rent payment, that type of thing. And so how do we discount it? Well, how do we do the present value calculation here for the lease li liability? Well, we're going to discount it based on either on the explicit lease rate that's being charged or the incremental, incremental borrowing rate. Um, most of the time, in my experience, there isn't uh, an interest rate that we can use in a contract to exercise. Some, every once in a while, I've seen a few lease agreements where they say, we're charging you 5.5% interest on this, what have you. A lot of times we're having to estimate based on an incremental borrowing rate. Um, and, and there's some guidance about how to make, how to determine an incremental borrowing rate, but basically uh, uh, an estimate of, of what you would be charged during the lease term uh, based on what you think you would, you would be charged if you went out and borrowed at any given time. So uh, as a practical expedient, I've generally found that, that or I've had some clients that have, um, talked to their bond counsel and said, hey, if we were to go out for, for debt right now, what would what would that rate be? Or approximately, what would that rate be? And that's a good way to get started on determining uh, uh, what your implicit borrowing rate might be. Um, Gasby also notes that Statement 62 provides some guidance on imputation of interest. So if you feel strongly that there should be a detailed uh, backup or you want a process to walk through, that's one place you could look as well. And then when might I remeasure my lease liability? Well, if there's a change in lease terms, that would that would imply a remeasurement. 
Uh, if you have an option that changed from being reasonably certain to not reasonably certain, you would want to remeasure. There was a change in the rate that was charged. I, I find it hard to, to think that, that there would often be a change in the rate charge that would affect the calculation that wouldn't change uh, the lease agreement itself, because usually we're talking about fixed payments. I've, I've seen it happen on occasion, but usually that's because there's a variable charge above and beyond that's changing. So we go in and we say, oh, I'm comparing my payment that I am making now to what I put in that original lease amount, well, usually it's because there's some variable component that's now being included in that calculation, and that's going to be under the standard expense in the current period anyway, so it wouldn't necessarily affect uh, our, our measurement of that lease liability. We wouldn't necessarily just go back and remeasure because of that, so we're going to have to be real careful as we get into subsequent periods thinking about what payments affect this lease liability and, and how to calculate those. And as we mentioned earlier, if something goes from being reasonably previously contingent and unlikely to being reasonably certain, that might uh, cause us to remeasure the lease liability as well. Uh, if we remeasure for any, any reason that's required, we would also update any variable components, basically saying, take a, take a new look at this. If you, if you remeasure for one specific reason, don't just don't just look at that one component. Take a good hard look at the entire contract, the entire lease agreement, see what's, see what's happening, and look at all of our components as a whole. We don't remeasure just for a change in the index rate or rate used to determine variable payments. Um, just that wouldn't be enough to trigger a remeasurement. If we do remeasure for another reason, again, there's a change in the lease term. Um, change, something changed from being reasonably certain and not reasonably certain. Uh, uh, again, remember to update the disc. We're going to update our discount rate. We're going to update all of our factors. Uh, and and uh, I think we have the statement maybe sort of implied on the previous slide, but uh, changing the incremental borrowing rate. If you go out, say say you had gone to bond council one year and they said, oh, it's four percent. The next year you were in a conversation with them, they said five percent. Now we think it was the amount that we would have to. Uh, uh, that that we would have to pay to get debt, that doesn't uh, imply a remeasurement just because of a change in incremental borrowing rate. The leased asset, this is what you're probably going to report in your capital asset footnote if you're the lessee, um, is initially measured at the same as the lease liability. And then there are po there's a possibility it could be different. I haven't seen in practice this often being the case, but you do need to add in any lease payments made to the lessor at or begin at the beginning of the lease term and any initial direct costs necessary to place the asset into service. And then, of course, you deduct any lease incentives. Uh, if you have lease incentives, uh, have a detailed conversation with, with whoever's helping you implement uh, 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 about those lease incentives and how they should be accounted for upfront, um, those get a little bit sticky. So how do we reduce our leased asset over time? Well, we're going to ask amortize or depreciate it. Uh, well, uh, we're going to amortize it, which is often functionally the same as depreciating it, in a systematic and rational manner over the shorter of the lease term of the useful life of the underlying asset. Um, we're going to treat this a lot like a capital asset in, in many ways, shapes, and forms, um, uh, where we're going to sort of have a depreciation schedule uh, uh, or an amortization schedule, as it were, and uh, we're going to systematically reduce that over the, the uh, useful life, let's call it, or the lease term. Uh, just one side note, if, if the underlying asset that you're leasing is non-depreciable, i.e. if you're leasing land, don't amortize that land. The GASB specifically states in paragraph 32 of the standard that if you're uh, leasing a non-depreciable asset, you don't need to amortize that leased asset, i.e. that the sort of concept is, is the similar to how you would account for uh, a normal capital asset. And then when should I remeasure the lease asset? Uh, usually when you have to remeasure the lease liability. Uh, there is one situation in which you might have a remeasurement or an adjustment to that lease asset that, that, that wasn't in conjunction with the lease liability, and that's if you have an impairment. If you have a lease asset impairment, and I haven't seen one of these yet, uh, but the, the impairment rules are similar to existing impairment rules under GASB 42. Um, and so first thing you would do is you'd reduce that asset to and the lease liability by the amount of the impairment, you just wouldn't go past zero, right? You wouldn't want to uh, uh, have a negative 
leased asset. So if you get down to an impairment where you would take that asset below zero, um, you'd want to recognize a gain loss instead. A reminder that if you're doing lessee accounting, especially if you're doing it in governmental funds, um, uh, uh, you've got uh, to record that capital outlay, you've got to record that those other financing sources and uses the proceeds on that, that uh, transaction. And then, of course, just some brief reminders about the disclosures in your financial statements. Uh, uh, if, you've, if, you've see, if you've seen a couple of issued financial statements, you'll notice that they have a general description, uh, total lease assets and accumulated depreciation. We break out the leased assets by the sort of major underlying class, like leased equipment, leased buildings, et cetera. And then, of course, any variable components would be reported as, as current period outflows or expenditures. We'll, we'd also disclose... Uh, uh, any payments not previously included in the lease term, they have similar requirements to sort of your debt footnote where you're recording, where you're reporting that first five years of principal and interest and then five year increments after that, and any commitments or impairments. Uh, just real briefly, the lessor accounting looks reasonably similar to the lessee accounting uh, uh, in, in that it's measured at the present value of lease payments expected to be received. Um, and the deferred inflow is measured at the value of the lease receivable plus any payments received at or before the commencement of the lease term that relate to future periods. If you're the lessor, you're going to recognize interest revenue on the lease receivable and an inflow of resources from the deferred inflows of resources in a systematic and rational manner over the lease term. Often this might be straight line over the lease term. Sometimes it might be a different basis. Uh, th that's something that you really want to think about when you're setting up your uh, receivable and your deferred inflow. And the lessor note generally tends to be a, just a touch shorter than our lessee note, but it's going to include a description of leasing arrangements and the total inflows, uh, i.e. the principal and interest of uh, uh, on those resources recognized from the leases. Uh, so if you're developing a plan for implementation, just a couple of comments. Uh, one, think about the fact that there is a potential for prior period restatement if that asset and liability are significantly different at the beginning of the period being implemented, uh, you could potentially have a restatement for that period. Um, if you present comparative statements, remember that it's got to be implemented as of the earliest period uh, presented. Um, and remember that if you previously reported a capital lease and that's now reported as a finance purchase, um, that, that that wording will need to change in your presentation. Uh, Gaz, we'd like us to remember never to forget the 12 most important words of the statement. And uh, I think it's, is it showing up hopefully for all of you guys? Ah, I see we've got sort of a click through here um, that it need not be applied to immaterial terms. So if as you're going through your implementation process and you set a capitalization threshold for uh, leases, which I think several of my clients did in conjunction with us uh, this year, uh, and they said, you know, nothing under $10,000, are we going to apply to leases? And we, we reviewed that and deemed it those, those items to be immaterial. Uh, and that we thought that was an appropriate way to handle it. So remember that, that if you have small things, uh, if they're immaterial to the, to the total picture of your financial statements, you need not apply the standard. And then negotiating lease terms, if you're negotiating new lease agreements, uh, think about uh, making it easier on yourself. Uh, think about the length of the agreement, the interest rate applied, multi-year implications, ask them to make some of this stuff explicit in the agreement. If they're giving you multiple components, ask them to separate those components for you in the terms of the agreement so that you don't have to exercise your sort of own professional judgment in, in separating those components. All right, I think we're here at CPE prompt number three, so we're going to throw that one up there. I'm sure all of us are going to choose LinkedIn as our professional platform of choice, but uh, as, as a child of the 90s and the early 2000s, I was a Facebook kid, so that'll always be my original. All right, I'm going to try to continue moving along a little faster here as we talk about GASB 96. I'm sure many of you are very concerned with this one coming up as you just implemented 87 and you're about to start thinking about 96. Well, the good news for you is that GASB 96 is quite similar 
to GASB 87. In fact, if you were to put the two side by side, you would see that 96 is actually, uh, uh, you could on a lot of these slides just change the term leased asset to subscription asset. Uh, and right to use of the underlying assets to right to use of an IT asset. And these things would actually line up pretty well. So uh, again, the FASB issued a standard, the GASB was, was gonna follow. It just, just was a matter of time. So what's a SPIDA, right? What's a subscription-based technology agreement, subscription-based information technology agreement, I should say. And you might hear me say, uh, someone's already pointed out that I sometimes said SPIDA agreements, which is agreement agreement. It's SPIDA contract in the actual standard. Um, it establishes the standard for recording a subscription asset and a subscription liability, uh, provides uh, capitalization criteria for outlays other than subscription payments. We'll talk about that sort of near the end establishes a requirement for footnote disclosures and it's effective for periods uh, uh, beginning after 6-15-2023. I think that's actually uh, ending on or after 6-15-2023. So what's a SPIDA? A SPIDA is a contract that conveys the control or right to use uh, another party's uh, a SPIDA vendor's information technology software alone or in combination with a tangible capital asset, i.e. the underlying IT assets as specified in the contract for a period of time in exchange or an exchange light transaction. Again, similar to how we were talking about leases earlier, um, if you have a contract that doesn't necessarily say, oh, this is a software agreement, but it gives you the right to use that software, you might well have a SPIDA. Um, the way that I've been describing this so far is if you have a login agreement, if you have a login that would expire if you didn't continue to pay a fee to that organization, that corporation that was providing that, that, that uh, software asset, you have a, an agreement that needs to be evaluated for whether it's a SPIDA. Uh, control of right to use, again, very similar to 87, present service capacity of the IT asset, uh, nature and manner of use of the underlying IT asset. Uh, it unlike 87, that ex it includes contracts that provide both IT support services and a right to use IT asset uh, and a service service support component. So this is, this is again, it's going to be a bit confusing. Um, what the GASB wants you to do is to be able to separate the actual IT asset from the sort of support or maintenance services. And if you have just support and maintenance services, that's not a SPIDA contract. If you have uh, software and support services and you can't extract those, you may well have a SPIDA contract. Um, the GASB would love it if you were to extract that component and just account for the uh, right to use of that asset, but that may not be practically possible. So don't just don't scope a contract out of your of, of a potential SPIDA contract just because it provides support and maintenance arrangements. Include that in your list of contracts to evaluate um, because you may well have a 96 uh, 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 impact there. So what's expli explicitly excluded? Anything that was previously uh, defined as a lease under GASB 87, anything uh, that is a contract just to provide support services, support and or maintenance, let's call that troubleshooting, what, what have you, however they just describe that in the contract. Um, anything uh, where a government is providing the right to use of their IT software and the associated tangible capital assets to another entity through a subscription-based agreement, right? And so this kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that there is no equivalent for lessor accounting in GASB 96, right? GASB 96 is basically uh, the lessee side of the accounting under GASB 87 only. It doesn't include the sort of lessor terms. Um, so if a government is providing another service, and we see this sometimes with, say, intermediate school districts where they're providing, you know, the right to use their license to a sub-school district, that's not going to fall under the terms of GASB 96. Now, of course, you want to review that contract carefully for how the language is, um, make sure that you're, you're making a clear decision, but generally speaking, that type of contract is scoped out of GASB 96. Anything that falls under GASB 94, which we'll touch on briefly later. 
Um, anything that's a perpetual license agreement. If you bought software and they said, yep, this is yours to use now forever. And we're just going to charge you like say a maintenance fee every year. Um, but something where your login wouldn't expire. If you stopped making the payment, you would still be allowed to log into that, that software and you, you own the right to use that license uh, in perpetuity, that would be excluded. Also excluded short-term SPIDAs. The rule on short-term SPIDAs is quite similar to the rule on leases, where if you have a, a maximum possible term of less than 12 months, uh, uh, you have a short-term SPIDA and you don't have a lot of reporting requirements under that. Again, rolling month to month, year to year, where that maximum possible term um, is the non-cancelable portion, uh, uh, you've got probably a, a short-term SPIDA. Uh, the, the rules for, for evaluating that subscription term are very similar to how you would evaluate a lease term. If you've got a one-sided uh, option to either terminate or to extend, um, you've got to evaluate that option if it's reasonably certain that it will be exercised or reasonably certain that it will be not be exercised, um, you would either include or exclude that period as appropriate. If you both have the option to terminate, again, same as the lease standard, you would consider that a cancelable period. Or if you both have to agree on, on extending the agreement, uh, that would be excluded from your, from your subscription term. Again, here, uh, we have sort of the more detailed list laid out uh, on this slide of the possible factors. So when, you, when you're gathering up those, those uh, subscription agreements and you're talking to your information technology director about, um, you know, hey, what, what agreements do we have out there that could possibly, you know, apply? Uh, and they say, okay, they're these ones and we're trying to determine lease terms now. And we get to those clauses where we have the option to renew and you say, tell me if it's reasonably certain. If they say back to you, well, what's reasonably certain? Uh, walk through this list with them. Uh, uh, what's our history of exercising these options? What do you think the incentives and disincentives are in the market? In practicality, it's unlikely that your IT director will say that back. They'll probably say, yeah, I intend to exercise that termination clause or no, I don't intend to exercise it. Um, but if, if you were to need a, a more detailed decision tree, there is one provided. Uh, again, the reassessment terms are pretty similar to what we, we experienced under 87. Um, if we don't exercise an option that we thought we were going to, if we do exercise an option we thought we weren't going to, if we had a contingent option uh, uh, that now actually, that we thought was a possibility that now actually does occur in all of those circumstances, we would, we would remeasure the subscription term. We would reassess the subscription term. Again, we have similar accounting. We're going to have a subscription liability, and we're going to have uh, an IT right to use of an asset to record. Again, the, the, the big focus of this entire statement is to get these long-term agreements with non-cancelable periods onto our balance sheet. Um, so having so so we're going to record that subscription liability, and we're going to do it at the present value of the payments expected to be made for the contract term. Again, these first two are the ones that are most common that, that you're going to have included in that lease liability. Uh, they're those fixed payments and those payments that are fixed in substance at the inception of either the, the subscription agreement or uh, uh, the implementation. And then, of course, there could be other possible items that the standard wants you to evaluate if you have payments for penalties. Again, these are sort of contingent options, contract incentives other payments that are reasonably certain based on all relevant factors, those could also be included. Again, we're going to measure our present value pretty similarly to how we did with uh, under 87. Either you're going to have an interest rate designated in that specific contract, or you're going to have an estimated incremental borrowing rate to estimate. Since we already probably had to do this for GASB 87, hopefully this, pro this, this process will be fairly similar under 96. And again, the rules for measuring the subscription liability are similar if there's a change in the subscription term. Um, if there's a change in the, in the estimated amounts for subscription payments that were already included in the measurement of the subscription liability, there's a change in the interest rate uh, uh, that's actually being charged, something that was previously contingent now becomes uh, reasonably certain, then we would have to remeasure that subscription liability.
So if we're measuring for another reason, then we also want to update that discount rate. Again, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. We want to look at the entirety, the whole of the agreement. If you have one of these factors, like a change in the term uh, or, or, or a change in the agreement in some way, shape, or form that would require you to remeasure, we want to look at all of the factors. And as previously stated, uh, in 87, you wouldn't just reassess the subscription liability um, uh, uh, just based on a change in the government's incremental borrowing rate. So our subscription asset, here's where we're going to uh, deviate most significantly from 87, because uh, when we take our subscription asset, we're going to initially measure that the same as a subscription liability. And for a lot of, I think, most of our simple contracts, those two things are going to end up being about the same. I think what's going to this this sort of second line of uh, second and third line items here are where we're going to get into the interesting changes. Again, payments associated with the SPIDA contract made to the vendor at the commencement of the subscription term. We saw that in 87. But here, item three, capitalizable initial implementation costs uh, could be a big difference. So what do we mean by that? We'll get to that in just a second. I think that's actually a slide or two down the road here. So we go through here, we capitalize any initial implementation costs. We know what our subscription asset is. Again, reminder that we need to amortize that in a systemic uh, or systematic and rational manner over the shorter of the subscription term or the useful life of the underlying IT assets. I think in practicality, I, I would have a hard time seeing where the useful life of the IT asset would be less than the subscription term. Otherwise, why would you continue to pay them for that entire term? Uh, but it's, I suppose it's theoretically possible, but pragmatically unlikely. So let's get to CPE prompt number four here. I'll give you a couple of seconds to fill that one out. All right, I'm reasonably certain that I'm still here. So I think that means we can keep going. So uh, going back to our thinking about capitalizable implementation costs, what is that gonna look like in, in actual uh, pragmatic implementation? Well, the GASB says they, they give us sort of three project stages of implementing new subscription-based IT software. And they say there's a preliminary project stage where you formulate, evaluate alternatives, determine the need for the technology, uh, you select alternative. I, I think of this basically as the uh, RFP stage. You're trying to see what your needs are. What are we going to do uh, with the technology? What... what where you're in sort of the selection phase. Then once you actually decide on that software and you start to put it into practice, and I, you know, of course, being a financial person, I'm thinking about uh, putting into practice a, a, you know, a financial management system. Uh, the GASB says the portions of that which you would want to capitalize are the portions where you're designing, coding, configuring, installing, and testing that new system where you're converting the data that you need to convert to make the underlying asset operational. Maybe that's if, again, if we're using our financial management software example, maybe that's where we're taking the data and we're rolling it into our new system. So we have a beginning balance to start from. And these, the GASB says, these are the costs that we want to capitalize, these initial implementation stage costs. costs. And then the ones, you know, so once we get into the operational and they call this the additional implementation stage. And again, this is going to be sort of a judgment call uh, uh, where we're training users, we're converting sort of other data, not the basic, you know, sort of we got the GL in there and now we're thinking about, you know, maybe project data, something like that. Uh, uh, we would expense that as incurred. So periods one and three here, we're sort of expensing as current period outflows. Uh, period two is potentially being capitalized as part of that uh, uh, subscription-based asset. Now, if this sounds similar to anything, it's because it's very similar to GASB statement number 86, uh, or I'm sorry, not GASB, FASB statement number 86. FASB statement 86 
uh, uh, gave us a preliminary and application development and a post implementation stage. Now, I think I've given this example on previous webinars, but my brother works for a software company over in New York, and he's responsible for doing application development. And so his controller recently gave him a spreadsheet that he needed some help filling out where he needed to allocate the time of his programmers to uh, uh, specific activities so that they could be sure that they were capitalizing their 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 costs for application development in accordance with FASB standard. I don't think this is likely to happen for every spit a contract. I think that this is probably going to be something you have to be concerned about um, with your sort of larger implementations where you have a significant amount of data to roll over, where you're making a big change that's going to affect a lot of components of your organization and there's a lot of time, effort, and expense needed to implement it. I'll also say that in some situations, it may not be internal costs you're allocating. Often, uh, again, it's similar to the FASB standard. They talk about third-party development fees. I remember when we were implementing some new software at uh, the last place that I was the accounting director, um, we brought in a third party to help us do a lot of that implementation, and we paid them as a third-party vendor. Those, those costs are, of course, easier to isolate and identify than internal costs might be to allocate to that application development phase. So this component is definitely something you need to be thinking about for any major uh, SPIDA implementations when you're thinking about measuring that subscription-based asset. Contract modifications and terminations. Any, an amendment should be considered to a SPIDA modification. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. An amendment should be considered a SPIDA modification unless the government's right to use the underlying IT assets decreases, in which case it'd be a, a partial or full termination. Basically here, we're saying if you get a right to use more assets, you probably have a modification. If you are reducing your right to use the asset, maybe you didn't need a module, et cetera, uh, we, that's a partial or full termination. So how should we account for modifications? Uh, uh, if you have, if it gives the government an additional subscription asset by adding more access to the underlying IT assets and the uh, uh, payments do not appear unreasonable for those components, we're going to remeasure that subscription liability and adjust the subscription asset. Um, so this is definitely something to think about if you're expanding your use. Say you were using BSNA and you were just using it for, um, and that might not be a great example because I think BSNA has a perpetual licensing agreement in some of its contracts. But say, but just using that as an example, because a lot of governments use it for property taxes, and say you wanted to implement the financial management portion, and that contract was a SPIDA agreement, not a perpetual licensing arrangement, you would need to think about remeasuring that subscription liability and asset that you had on there for the portion that was just the component for property taxes. And now that you're adding, this new agreement. Now, again, you might account for that as a separate agreement. We'd have to sort of walk through the decision tree uh, and see is like, oh, is this now just one agreement that you have? If you have a reduction in the right to use the underlying subscription asset, uh, uh, you potentially have a gain or loss. Remember in the, in the previous uh, uh, GASB standard for leases, we were talking about not reducing your asset uh, uh, below zero, and the same is applicable under GASB 96, right? We don't want to, initially, we will record that termination by reducing the asset and the liability in corresponding fashion. We don't want to go below zero. You'd have either a gain or a loss. Same with an impairment. Again, works the same way as 87. We would I, we would review it under the GASB 42 guidance to see if this asset was, in, this subscription-based asset was impaired. And we'd first offset it against any changes in the liability, and then we would recognize an impairment. Also the same in governmental funds at inception. If you have a new subscription technology agreement, uh, you're going to record for that. When you put it on the books, you're going to have a capital outlay, and you're going to have an offsetting proceeds uh, for, uh, as an other financing source. And your notes for this are going to look very similar to your disclosure notes under 87. You're going to have a description of the basis terms and conditions. You're going to have your total subscription assets offset by accumulated depreciation. Again, you have to separate that from your other capital assets. You can't present those net in the footnote. 
You're going to have any current year outflows for variable payments not previously included. You're going to disclose those separately. You're also going to disclose any current year outflows not previously included. You're going to disclose your sort of five year ske your schedule of, of the first five years and then in five years incremental after that, which is again looks very similar to your debt footnote disclosures in previous years. If you have any commitments or impairments on your SPIDAs, you would enclose, disclose those in your footnote as well. Again, I think we've mentioned this before, but there is a potential for a prior period restatement because you have to apply it as of the earliest period presented. Um, I just did an 87 implementation for someone who had a comparative presentation. So if you have um, a comparative presentation, restatement is more likely. Uh, uh, and of course, you're permitted to, under the standard, but not required to include in the measurement of the subscription asset capital out, capitalizable outlays associated with that initial implementation stage, remember that blue stage in the middle on that previous slide, um, incurred prior to the implementation of the statement. So there's possibility that you may have incurred some of those costs in putting this into service before the actual implement implementation of the standard, and you might still need to include those, uh, uh, or you have the option to include those in your valuation of the asset when you actually implement. Again, we have our 12 most important words. Always remind you that, that if, it's, if it's an immaterial item, uh, uh, we don't need to apply the terms of this standard. Um, uh, specifically thinking about trying to set a capitalization threshold for what you might consider to be too small to, to uh, uh, actually implement this standard for. So of course, materiality is, is a discussion with your auditors, but if you've got something that you think is too small, uh, bring that up early. Uh, uh, may, you might still have to go through the exercise to prove that that amount is too small, um, but, but you potentially don't need to do the full accounting and recording for that contract. And again, if you're negotiating a new SPIDA agreement or a new SPIDA contract, I should say, uh, you might want to consider making explicit the length of the agreement, lay that out real clearly, what the interest rate that they're going to charge you is, uh, the the uh, explicit, I, I love to see whenever I see a contract and there's an explicit schedule for fixed and variable payments, I really like to see that um, because if you don't have to pull those sort of um, terms out of the paragraph of the, uh, uh, of the agreement, um, that makes it a lot easier. Uh, explicit de determination of a contract cost related to components and or modules. Uh, if you can get your provider to say, hey, you were going to charge you this much for maintenance, and we're going to charge you this much for actually using the software license, and we're going to charge you this much for these three modules and this much for these four modules, um, that's helpful in doing the accounting. Now, the provider may not want to do that. I've run into the situation a few times where uh, the provider is providing sort of a net discount on their underlying pricing uh, by uh, either giving you a module or component for free. You know, there is something that was that was during the negotiation, you're trying to negotiate the best price, right? So these aren't the, having an explicit determination isn't the only consideration that you need to be engaged in. Um, when you're trying to determine a contract or an agreement, but it, it might well uh, be one of the components that you have to consider. All right, so we've got CPE prompt number five here. Uh, I think we're gonna put that up on the screen. All right, perfect. I'm going to freewheel for just a second here because I want to talk about something uh, that I didn't put in the slides, which is just some of the practical considerations uh, uh, before we move on to doing GASB 94 here. 
if you're thinking about doing or not thinking about doing, if you're coming up on an implementation of either 87 or 96, one of the things I strongly encourage you to do is to summarize all of your lease terms in some type of fashion. Of course, I'm an accountant, so I love myself a good Excel document um, and lay out explicitly in detail each either lease or subscription based agreement where uh, uh, you have uh, lay out that lease term, who's the counterparty, uh, what term, what periods are subject to renewal, what your regular fixed payment is, put that all into a schedule uh, and have every agreement that you're considering, not just the ones where you end up implementing either 87 or 96, but every agreement that you're considering and put that into a schedule and make a clear determination on that schedule. Then you can take that schedule and you can review that in conjunction with the actual agreements with your auditors. Uh, uh, it, as you come to a, a decision on how you're going to implement which lease agreements are, are, are requiring GASB 96 and GASB 87 implementation, um, and you know which ones are going to fall under the standard and what, what terms you have, then you can actually get into the nitty gritty of doing the calculation. And I suggest this because uh, I ran into a lot last year of clients where we come on uh, out there and they'd say, well, we need help. And oh, yeah, we're just starting field work. Well, a really good time to be thinking about this is right now before you've even begun to have your auditors out, out on site and start thinking about which agreements do you have Collect, making sure you have a complete list of them, making sure you have a complete list of the terms. And then, you know, we can have those conversations back and forth um, about, you know, okay, I think maybe your decision on this was right or was maybe need some adjustment. And then we, we have that real clear list. We can start getting into actually the nuts and bolts of doing the calculations. And that part is, you know, uh, more, more procedural. The, the real judgment call comes into play where you're trying to determine that lease term and you're trying to determine, you know, what you have the right to exercise and what the counterparty has the right to exercise. Those are the ones which really require a lot of professional judgment. So you really want to, to sort of have those conversations and, and have that deliberation and that summary up front. Um, and that applies to both 87 and 96 um, um, as you're thinking about uh, uh, possible contracts and possible uh, implementation. All right, so GASB 94. Um, public-private and public-public partnerships, as well as APAs, which are availability payment arrangements. I'm not expecting a lot of governments to have a, a, a ton of 94 applicable agreements. Um, I think the most common thing that I've seen thus far that might fall under the standard of, of a PPP or an APA agreement are uh, ones where that we all the, the 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 agreement was determined in the past to be a service concession agreement under GASB 60, and we'll see that in a moment when we look at the sort of flow chart. But so, what does the GASB define as a PPP arrangement? Well, for the purposes of the statement, a PPP arrangement is one in which the government, which they'll usually refer to in the standard as a transferor, contracts with an operator to provide public services by conveying control of the right to operate or use the non-financial asset, such as infrastructure, something along those lines for a period of time in an exchange or an exchange-like transaction. Sounds similar? It's fairly similar to what we saw in 87 and 96. Again, the intention of this standard, uh, uh, similar to 87 and 96, is to put long-term agreements onto your balance sheet. Could the government be an operator? I want to make this explicit because if you actually decide, if you actually think this has some applicability to you and you go through and you read the statement, uh, the, the, the term transferor is usually discussed as being the, the, the government and the operator is discussed as sort of being the private or third party. But the government could also, uh, a government could also be an operator. Um, this is the straight out of the footnotes, the statement where it says references to the operator could include both governmental and non-governmental entities. And we see that in some of the language that's used uh, in GASB 94. The transferor, always a government. Operator might be a government. Again, trying to compare this to the language used in the lease standard we have, that would be similar to the lessor and lessee. 
uh, the liability being the PPP liability. On 87, this would be the lease liability. And of course, under 96, we're thinking subscription liability. Intangible right to use of an asset. In the PPP standard 94, we call it a right to use asset. Under the lease standard, we call this a lease asset. Uh, underlying asset, we have the underlying PPP asset. And in lease standard, we just call this the underlying asset. We call this a subscription or IT assets in 96. Then the receivable, there's a possible receivable and deferred inflow of resources under this standard, similar to sort of your lessor accounting uh, under GASB 87. So here's our quick flow chart that the GFOA has provided us on sort of how we think uh, this, this standard is going to be implemented. So I think the most common situation is going to be where you already have a service concession agreement. If you've already got a service concession agreement, you probably are, or not probably, you are going to be following GASB 94 guidance for putting a long-term uh, asset and liability onto your books. Uh, the one I've seen thus far is some parking arrangements have previously been qualified where the government is sort of assigning the rights to you to, to an operator uh, to collect third-party fees. Under GASB 60, sort of one of the main delete, delineating factor is we're assigning the rights that we have as the government to provide public services to an operator and they're collecting fees from a third party. If that's the case, you may well have a service concession arrangement. And if you have a service concession arrangement, you're probably applying the standard of under GASB 40. Uh, if it doesn't meet the service concession arrangement agreement uh, and you do have an underlying PPP asset, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, that are not existing assets of the government slash transfer or you are still implementing 94. If you don't meet the SCA definition, you have underlying assets and there are improvements to be made by the operator, which are required. Again, you're going to have this, uh, you're going to have to implement 94. The only situation in which this falls back and is probably a lease is it, it's not a service concession arrangement. The underlying PPP assets uh, are existing assets of the transferor, and there are no improvements required made required to be made by the operator. Uh, the GFOA has sort of given a rough translation of this standard uh, uh, and called them type one, where you have an existing asset with, with, with or without operator made improvements. Type two, where you have a new asset that's constructed and it is a service concession arrangement. And type three, where you have a new asset acquired or constructed by the operator, and it's not a service concession arrangement. So how do we deal with initial recognition if you're a type one or a type two? Well, at the commencement of the PPP term, you're going to recognize a receivable for future PPP payments or a deferred inflow of resources. Uh, if and when the operator made improvements for type one or new underlying PPP assets for the type two are placed into service, you're going to recognize an addition to capital assets and that deferred inflow of resources offsetting that addition to capital assets. Again, uh, you can see that our intention here is, is very similar to those other two standards. We're trying to get these long-term agreements and any related underlying capital assets onto our balance sheet. I'm sorry. Oh, Siri thought I was talking to her for a second. Uh, type three, where, where the uh, new underlying PPP asset is being placed into service, you're going to recognize a receivable for future PPP payments, a receivable for the underlying PPP asset, and a deferred inflow of resources. So how are we going to go about calculating the PPP term? Well, again, it's going to look very similar to our decision tree under 87 and 96. The one nice thing about these three standards is that the GASB is being uh, reasonable, uh, is being very consistent with how they're asking us to determine the actual terms for these agreements. So again, if you are reasonably certain based on all relevant factors that the operator will exercise an option or that they will not exercise an option, if you're reasonably certain the transferor will exercise an option or the transferor will not exercise that option, that's how we'd adjust our non-cancelable lease term period uh, to get our sort of uh, total PPP term to, to record this asset liability based on pre present value. Uh, our PPP and APA arrangements um, uh, are both covered under this standard. So what's an APA arrangement? It's an availability payment arrangement, which is 
uh, uh, where another party is uh, designing, constructing, or financing a non-financial asset where the ownership of the asset transfers to the government at the end of the contract. Now, you say, Dan, how is this different from just a finance purchase? Well, the Gatsby says it's not. Uh, the Gatsby says if you've constructed a contract or an arrangement where you are making payments to a third party and they're constructing an asset, whether you defined that as sort of a financing purchase agreement uh, contract or not, we still think that the underlying substance of that agreement is that the government is providing compensation to another entity for providing them that asset. So we should report that similar to a finance purchase agreement. So the last standard we're going to cover today uh, is GASB 101, or compensated absences. Um, now, previously, we've, we've, we've had compensated absences on our books now for quite some time. In fact, ever since GASB 16 uh, was implemented, we've had a uh, compensated absence standard. Well, under GASB 16, uh, the sort of rule for when should we record uh, a compensated absence liability was only to the extent that it's probable that the employer will compensate the employees for the benefit through cash payments conditioned on the employee's termination or retirement. So in the past, when we've been uh, reviewing our compensated absences calculations to record that liability, that's been sort of the bright line. Uh, uh, for for what is included and what's not included. Do we think that we're going to have to pay them on termination of this obligation? That's going to change a little bit under this standard. Uh, uh, the requirements of this standard are effective for fiscal years beginning on or after December 15th, 2023. Uh, and I've just included a couple of year ends uh, for some of my clients that will be common, those that are December 31st, 2025. June 30th, 2025, and September 30th, 2025. So generally speaking, fiscal year 2025. So how, how does this change? Under 101, what's different for me about uh, my compensated absence liability than it was under GASB 16? Well, under GASB 101, a compensated absence is a a compensated absence is a leave for which employees may receive one or more of the following, a cash payment when the leave is used for time off, other cash payments, such as a payment for unused leave upon termination of employment, or a non-cash settlement, such as a conversion to defined benefit post-employment benefits. Now, that payment or settlement could, incur, could occur either during employment or upon termination of employment. And that's sort of the key statement here, uh, is that, that it no longer is just based on what am I going to pay out when that employee leaves? Now we have some consideration of what's going to happen during the employment. I'd also like to point out that the GASB notes in their description of what a compensated absence is as something that is a conversion to a defined benefit post-employment uh, 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 value. Like say uh, at the end of my termination, I could get paid out by uh, having an additional two service years credited to uh, my, my uh, defined benefit pension. The GASB also says that they specifically don't want you to include that in the liability. So I don't want anyone get anyone to get tri tripped up here. They include it in their definition of what a compensated absence is. They say don't include it when you're calculating the liability. So what are good examples of a compensated absence? Could probably are going to include vacation days, annual leave, sick leave, paid time off for PTO, holidays, parental leave, bereavement leave, and they also say certain types of sabbatical leave, which wasn't uh, something that we really considered much in the past. Uh, they do include some specific statements on sabbatical leave. So if you're a an government organization or a higher education institution that does offer sabbatical leave, you want to be real careful here because the GASB differentiates between sabbatical leave during which you're required to perform duties and sabbatical leave, which is essentially unrestricted. So if my organization offers me two months of sabbatical leave and says, we're putting no uh, sort of terms or agreements on what you can do during this time, uh, uh, then that's a compensated absence uh, that, that you're going to record a liability for. If you're going to say, oh, you can have a sabbatical, but during the sabbatical, all you're going to be doing is doing research. Uh, 
the guys of you says, well, that's just work. That's not an actual compensated absence. They're not absent. They're researching. They might not be on campus teaching uh, students, but they still have uh, they still have job responsibilities. So that's not a compensated absence under 101 that you would record a liability for. Similar to our point about sort of defined benefit uh, conversions. So another good question, does this apply to termination benefits, termination benefits like early retirement incentives or severance payments? And the GASB says specifically no, that the new standard on compensated absences does not apply to things that are already covered under GASB statement number 47, accounting for termination benefits as amended. So what are the rules now? Well, the rules now are going to be that a liability should be recognized for leave that has not been used if all of the following attributes are true. A, the leave is attributable to services already rendered. B, the leave accumulates. And C, the leave is more likely than not to be used for time off or otherwise paid in cash or settled through non-cash means. So basically, the GASB is trying to help us develop a fact pattern here of, of what do we think, once we decide what our compensated assets balances are, how do we analyze those balances? So I think what this is going to look like for a lot of governments is you're still going to run your uh, sort of uh, schedule of, of leave balances at the end of the year. And hopefully you have a good payroll system that's able to produce, you know, the balances of your vacation, sick, uh, uh, comp time, all of that type of stuff. And you're going to have to look at every category and ask your, ask the question, does it meet A, B, and C? And the real question of, of rule C is going to be, what is more likely than not? So every year, we're going to have to evaluate is it more likely than not that in this leave category, uh, that time is going to be used for time off or otherwise paid in cash settled or through non-cash means by assessing relevant factors? So thinking about, again, you know, remember when we were talking about 96, remember when we were talking about statement number 87, uh, what were our, our we, we had a small, a, a short sort of decision tree that we could go through to help us determine, is it reasonably likely that this is going to happen? Well, here they're also giving us a small decision tree. They're saying, look at your policies related to compensated absences. Uh, if that leave uh, is earned or will become eligible for use or payment in the future. Uh, I think the big one is probably gonna be C, historical information about the use payment or forfeiture of compensated absences. Uh, as as an auditor, I am probably going to say as you're as you're going through this decision tree on each category, uh, uh, show me some historical information that you're using to make this decision because I think personally I think that's probably the strongest indicator. Unless you have, you know, there there could be other information known to the government, uh, item D, that would indicate that historical information isn't representative. So that's that's an absolutely a possibility, but I think that 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 this new decision tree is definitely going to require us to to look through some of that historical information and make educated decisions about is it likely that the employees are going to use this time. The only situation in which I think it's likely, so say you have a vacation balance and you've gone through this decision tree. Uh, uh, the only way I think it's likely that you won't be recording. A liability for that vacation balance is if you think there's a possibility that that employee never gets to use it and or never gets it paid out. If they're never going to get to use it and you think it's likely that they're never going to use it and it's never going to be paid out and you can show a historical fact pattern on that, maybe it's not included in the liability. But I do think that this is going to scope in a lot more things than it scopes out from our previous standard. So what pay rate am I going to use to measure that liability? Um, you're going to use this, the, the employee's pay rate as of the date of the financial statements. This is unchanged. Though the GASB does uh, make a note that if the leave is more likely than not to be paid at a rate different than their current pay rate, uh, the, the, the government should measure that portion of the liability using a different rate. Now, what do they mean by that? They mean that if for some reason or another, uh, uh, that maybe that, that vacation time is paid out at one half of your pay rate instead of your full pay rate, uh, then you would use 
one half of the pay rate to measure the liability. I think those are the, uh, the only sort of common situations in which you're not going to use their actual pay rate to measure the whole liability. The GASB also notes that you're going to include salary-related payments. What are salary-related salary payments? Well, they say only thing they say specifically is Social Security and Medicare taxes. Um, thus far, I've sort of read this as it's probably fringes and maybe other payments. Um, I, I don't think that they were trying to uh, do an end around here. I don't think that they were trying to you know, say it's going to be something other than fringes, but I do think that they were trying to leave themselves some wiggle room for, you know, okay, there could be something beyond just the traditional fringe benefit payment amounts that might be directly related to incurring that leave obligation, and we should think about including those amounts. So what, what impact will have this, this have on the financial statements? Well, one, I think on average, just in general, most people's compensated absence liabilities are going to increase rather than decrease. I also think that it's going to simplify just slightly some of the actual reporting. Under the previous standards, you had to report a net increase, net decrease in your re roll forward, right? You had to show what are additions and deletions? And that was always very difficult uh, for, for a lot of governments to produce accurate information, especially information that was going to tie back to their uh, underlying records. And very often we had to do some type of an estimate uh, because it's it's uh, sort of trying to create a perfect additions, deletions, roll forward. Plus, remember, you're measuring last year's liability at pay rates as of that date, and you're measuring this year's liability at pay rates as of this date. Um, so those things were just never going to add up perfectly. They did a, remove that disclosure requirement going forward. So you'll be able to present a net increase or net decrease. Specifically, they, they included the statement that you, you, you don't need to have that roll forward as, as a requirement for long-term debt in the same way. So if you, you're going to be able to show just your net change in compensated absence liability, I personally think that's a better option for everybody involved. So CPE prompt number six, we'll put that up there on for a second, and then we'll hopefully bring it home here. Well, hopefully everyone learned at least something a little bit new today. All right, so uh, thinking about what's coming up and some of the concept statements that the GASB is releasing. So what, what is a concept? A concept statement is non-authoritative. It's part of the conceptual framework for governmental gap. And the GASB uses this as a guide for, for future standard setting. Um, the GASB issues concept statements primarily to, to make sure that what they're doing, excuse me, what they have done and what they're going to do is consistent. So a lot of times you see concept statements introducing new terminology, uh, clarifying existing terminology. What, what they want to do is to have as few possible disagreements with existing gap and future possible gap as possible. Um, because every once in a while you see things like uh, when we when we looked back at at some of our upcoming GASB standard, we had two omnibus standards between GASB 90 and GASB 101. I think it's GASB 94 and GASB 97, 90, 97. And the reason for omnibus statements is usually that they're 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 clarifying. Someone has said to them at some point, "Oh, these standards here and here that you issued seem to be conflicting." So they'll issue uh, clarifications, and the so concept statements are a way for them to try to get out ahead uh, of those uh, 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 of those issues. So the new concept statement that's that's out there is concept statement number seven. Again, this one is mostly defining um, uh, terminology that they use. They talk about communication methods in general purpose, external financial reporting. That's that's giving definition to what does it mean 
for what is they they get they define what is display, which is recognition and basic financial statements. They define uh, uh, what is disclosure, that's putting something in the notes. Uh, what what is RSI, that type of thing. Uh, they define user responsibilities. They say if you're going to be a user of a financial statement, you 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 have a responsibility to obtain a general reasonable understanding of that government and their activities. The, uh, of the fundamentals of government financial reporting and to study that information with reasonable diligence and apply analytical skills. Uh, basically saying you can't consider yourself a user of the financial statements and not have any understanding of sort of financial reporting framework. Um, the purpose of note disclosures, they talk about supplements uh, uh, and, uh, and if is it essential to making economic, social, and political decisions and the criteria for note disclosures? These last three here, the purpose, criteria, and essentiality, I think what the GASB really wants to do there is they're trying to, they, they, they feel like some of our note disclosures are getting a bit long, which, which I say, well, then why'd you give us so many requirements in the first place? But they, 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 they want to be sure that governments aren't just putting in information about the future, things that are subjective, things that could potentially be predictions of future events. They, they want the governments to be really selective when they think about what they're including in a note disclosure. Um, there's also an exposure draft out there uh, for certain risk disclosures, and this is primarily around concentration and constraints. When I was listening to Stephen Gauthier talk about this uh, a few weeks back at the GFOA presentation, um, this is sort of related to some of the the, the uh, previous rules that have been into place on going concern. And there's some potential upcoming changes to going concern as well. But uh, the, the governments are, aren't necessarily subject to going concern in the same way that industry might be. Um, but how, where it's very unlikely that a government is ever going out of business unless you know some school districts have been combined with other school districts on occasion. There, there have been instances. But in most instances, we sort of have these con the things that are restricting us in the future aren't us going out of business. It's sort of concentrations and constraints, right? And so the GASB is, is entering into this exposure draft thinking about what type of disclosures might we have in the future around concentrations and constraints where there are uh, uh, we're having uh, uh, difficulty either raising resources, we're having difficulty controlling spending. What possible events in the future might occur that would affect a government's ability to provide services at the level they've currently been provided or to meet obligations as they come due? Now, these factors could revolve around several things, but uh, it's going to be a lot of judgment call, right? It could be you have a big principal employer, there's a significant change, it's going to affect your property tax base in a huge way. Same if you have a principal industry that's having a big shift or principal resource provider. Uh, 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 what constraints might exist? Are you are you at your property tax cap? Are you having a, a, a limitation on spending other than just your sort of normally budgeted amounts? Uh, are you having a limitation on the occurrence of debt? Are you close to your debt limit? I know very few governments that are close to their debt limit, but if you were, the GASB thinks that that might be something that we should have a standard around disclosing. And then they give us a decision tree uh, to help us decide um, what would be a con concentration or a constraint that 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 might need to be disclosed. So they say, has it occurred? Is it more likely than not to occur within 12 months of the date of the financial statements or shortly thereafter? Uh, will it affect that they're within three years? Will it affect their ability to provide services at a level currently provided in this reporting period or to meet future obligations as they come due? So again, this standard is this, this exposure draft is out there. It's possible we have a future standard coming around uh, certain risk disclosures and, and it will, it will re revolve around sort of the idea of concentrations and constraints. And finally here, the GASB has an exposure draft on their new implementation guide. I don't think anyone is surprised uh, since uh, 87, 96 and 94 are all complicated standards and involve a lot of professional judgment and a lot of determination of contracts in a way that governments haven't, uh, that accounting departments and finance departments and auditors have to evaluate in ways that they didn't have to before. I mean, I don't know that I've ever read as many contracts uh, or expected to read as an accountant and not a lawyer as many contracts as we've had to read this year. So the GASB has proposed nine new sets of questions and answers. Six of them relate to GASB 87, the standard on leases. Uh, two of them relate to GASB 96 on SPIDAs. 
uh, and one is related to GASB 100, which is uh, uh, this, the new standard on accounting changes and error corrections. They also did release one potential change to uh, the existing implementation guidance on leases, uh, where they sort of clarified and revised an existing stance. So all of those are available through the GASB's website if you're interested in looking those up. So with that, I think we're here at the end of our time today. I appreciate all of you joining us and uh, look forward to uh, speaking with you again next time. This concludes today's program. Thank you so much for joining us. With respect to people's time, we'll be reaching out directly to answer all the questions submitted. If you'd like to learn more, please visit Raymond's website at www.raymond.com, or you can also email us at publicsector at Thank you and have a great rest of the day.